Good morning, everybody. It's a big pleasure for me to welcome you here in the I-24 News newsroom behind me and in the Arabic I-24 News studio. My name is Franck Meloul. I'm the CEO of I-24 News. I'm very happy to have you here with me, uh, Kalev Ben David, who is the host of our news prime time, the rundown that you can watch every day on I-24 News. So before to give you a few words about uh, where I-24 News is standing right now and to chat with you and to exchange, let's begin with a few words from Dr. Francine Stein, chair of the National Board of the American Zionist Movement. Uh, thank you, Frank. I'm very pleased to be here this morning to welcome you to a program that will highlight the five women's Zionist organizations in the American Zionist movement, as well as the Young Judea Youth Movement. On behalf of myself and Richard Heidemann and the AZM leadership, uh, I think this will be a very exciting program. For those of you that don't know about the AZM, the American Zionist movement is comprised of 33 national Jewish organizations working across a broad ideological, political, and religious spectrum and it brings together the American Jewish community in support of Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. AZM is also the Zionist Federation in the World Zionist Organization and was the group that facilitated the United States election to the World Zionist Congress, where 123,000 American Jews voted for their voice in Israel, one of the largest numbers ever. Since uh, its inception, the AZM, um, the women Zionist leaders have played a very important role. They participated in the first Zionist Congress with Herzl and voted in the Zionist movement 20 years before women had the right to vote in the United States. Feminism and Zionism go hand in hand. The impact of these women's organizations reaches from hospitals, healthcare, to schools and education programs, as well as social services and daycare and advocating for women's rights. Please join me as we hear about the important work they are doing. And I wish all of you good health and um, safety. And uh, now, Frank, I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Francine. Uh, as I said just uh, before, we are here in the middle of the newsroom of I-24 News. As you know, I-24 News was launched uh, seven years ago broadcasting in three languages, in French, in English, and in Arabic. And if we decided today to talk to you and to exchange with you from the Arabic studio of I-24 News, it's because the last few months show us how much the strategy of I-24 News, the DNA of I-24 News, became a reality with the signature of the Abraham Agreement. And I want to tell you how much we are proud to be in the middle of this new dynamic in the region, to be part of this new Middle East, because you know, most of the time, the media are just monitoring what's going on in the region. And here, with the Abraham Agreement, I-24 News got the opportunity to become a big player of the Abraham Agreement, and we were the first Israeli uh, broadcast to sign an agreement with a big Arabic media platform, Abu Dhabi Media, and we are also the first Israeli channel to be broadcast in the biggest cable network in the Gulf, Etisalat. So just before to tell you more about this, I want to show you a short clip showing you this reality on I-24 News. <laughs> After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. Israelis, Emiratis, and Bahrainis are already embracing one another. We are eager to invest in a future of partnership, prosperity, and peace. I'm thrilled to be standing next to our Moroccan and Israeli partners in Rabat to open the door wide to a new era of cooperation. Israel Sudan. 
איזה מהפך אדיר. היסטוריק מובס רישייפינג דה מידל איסט. The Abraham Accords ending a 26-year freeze in the development of the diplomatic relations between Israel and its regional neighbours. With the announcement that the United Arab Emirates and Israel will normalise relations followed less than a month later by Bahrain. I think it opens up a lot of opportunities from different aspects. And this is something we are really proud of, that we're creating for the youth uh, uh, and the generation to come many, many opportunities in many, many sectors. And opening the door to North Africa, Sudan signaling normalization in October and Morocco following suit in December. This agreement between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco is bring stability to our region. New business deals and partnerships in banking, innovation, tourism, culture, health and trade flourishing before the ink had even dried on the agreements. What fascinated us most uh, looking at uh, Israel is how quickly the economy grew here and GDP grew and how it's primarily all driven by innovation and technology. Uh, and this is something we'd like to learn more from, from the, the Israeli private sector. And peeling off the layers of the region's unique and complex realities. The Iranian people are the most, the most suffering uh, people uh, in the region because of the Iranian regime. Let's show them what peace can bring to them. Should Israel stand in the way of F-35 sales to now regional partners such as the United Arab Emirates? Providing uh, am any ammunition to any country around uh, Israel here in the region is bad for us. Okay, that's for sure. I mean, so it's not as simple as that. However, we understand, number one, there is no way to prevent America to sell or to do anything. Et aujourd'hui, une relation entre le Maroc et Israël, une perspective d'une solution au Sahara à travers l'autonomie, je pense que ce sont des atouts entre les mains de cette nouvelle administration et le Maroc est prêt à travailler avec cette nouvelle administration. And in a region this complex, a new opportunity to bring the diverse voices from right here on the ground to the rest of the world. We launched today a cooperation. I signed the MOU with the CEO of Abu Dhabi Media, which is a big leader, a big player in the region. I'm very proud that I24 News will be part of this process and with Abu Dhabi Media, to show to the rest of the world the reality day by day of this new Middle East. And more opportunities wait on the horizon. The impact is global, if I may say so, because the whole world is watching, really. We're setting a template for others to follow. So this is the new reality of the Middle East that we are very proud to show on I24 News, and we will continue to stay connected to this new Middle East. So let's move on now with our first participating organization today, which is AMIT, an educational network in Israel providing innovative Jewish values-based education, is having a life-changing impact on more than 41,000 children, 70% of whom come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Take a look just on that. Everybody. We have with us Audrey Trachman, the national president of Amit. As a longtime resident of Israel, I know that barely touches on what Amit does. I've heard some great lectures at Amit to Moadonim uh, uh, throughout Israel. But Audrey, why don't you fill us in a little more on Amit's activities? Well, thank you so much, Frank, and thank you so much, Kalev. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about Amit. Um, I guess to start with today, AMIT is really an educational powerhouse. We drive 
educational excellence for more than 41,000 students in Israel. And for the last three years, the Ministry of Education has been doing um, a ranking of the of the educational institutions. And in each of the past three years, we have been ranked number one. And that's because we really are um, data driven and we're making sure that our students really receive the absolute best education because we our core mission is really evening the playing field. As you mentioned, two thirds of our kids come from disadvantaged homes and communities. In Israel, I think they're termed uh, mostly periphery, but that's really probably euphemistic. They really have social and economic disadvantages. Just to give you a feel for that, roughly 25% of Ethiopian um, students are educated in Amit schools. So our um, really our core objective is to give every kid, no matter their background, the opportunity to reach their potential. And that could be in STEM, in art, in literature. Um, I wish it wasn't the case, but but in Israel's startup nation, oftentimes success is based on where you come from. And um, we're really trying to change that because we um, believe that every kid deserves a chance. Um, for most of our history, we were a religious network. Um, but for the past few years, we've incorporated secular schools into our network. And the reason that they want to join is because they see our holistic educational program of Gogia, which combines content and pedagogy with Jewish values and secular studies as really being valuable for themselves. We are thrilled to include these secular schools because we view ourselves as a big tent. And especially now we see Another core um, goal of ours is to help um, society break down walls and the um, animosities that have built up. We want to really create um, an Israel where everybody is um, involved with one another. So that's what we do. Just to give you a sense of our history, um, Betsy Gottfeld founded Amit 96 years ago. At that point, most Zionist organizations um, were not as appreciative of their women leaders. Um, women collected money and men decided how to, uh, how to spend it. And so she and some like-minded women got together and set up their own organization. The first thing um, that they did was to um, was to create a, um, a technical school in Jerusalem for girls. And through that, it's just grown. So um, I don't know if uh, Bessie Godfeld knew the adage, give a woman a fish, and I'm taking a little poetic license here, and uh, you feed her for a day but teach a woman to fish and you feed her for a lifetime. And that is what we do at Amit. Audrey, briefly, uh, the pandemic, of course, has been really hard on the educational system, but Amit with its schools, especially the seminaries where kids are there, had, could you briefly describe just facing that challenge over the past year? Of course. Um, so there really are several um, components to that. I'll start with just education. Um, we were lucky and smart, um, good combination, because we had already um, started to embark on a, um, a very strong um, online learning program. And um, and we were really um, ready because we were trying, we, we are in the process of really changing education across um, the Rashet. So we had built up a platform where content was, was being developed for that platform and being rolled out. Therefore, um, long distance learning wasn't such a problem for us. We also had master teachers that knew technology and how to really um, reach kids using technology. So um, that, that part of it worked out well for us. What didn't work out so well was um, because of the economic disarray in Israel and the fact that our kids start really from disadvantaged 
just also to give you an idea, we have lunch programs for kids that even before this had uh, food insecurity. So we actually ha had people that mapped out every single, the principals, the teachers, all of our students' needs. And um, we normally have special funds. They weren't enough. We um, gave out 3,000 computers. We gave out um, money for food. We've um, done whatever it takes to make sure that our kids can learn. And in addition, um, absenteeism is a problem um, because many of these kids don't have their mothers or fathers sitting with them and saying, you know, get back on Zoom. So um, we've really spent a lot of time also on right. um, making sure the kids are in school. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you, Ray. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Joining us now next is Emuna, a social service agency in Israel, whose mission is to help alleviate the burdens of Israel's social problems and strengthen Israeli society. Emuna provides vital education and support services for children and adults during times of crisis and helps transform dire tra tragedy into success. Emuna cares for the most vulnerable children and families in Israel. 24-7, 365 days a year. Providing a loving Jewish home. Giving at-risk children hope for a better tomorrow. Supporting and educating children who have failed in the past, allowing them to thrive and succeed. Providing counseling and supporting women and children living with the daily threat of domestic violence. the time they need and a place in the heart of the community. Teaching parents the skills they need to cope with daily family life and to break the cycle. Rescuing at-risk infants to teens, providing a safe haven night and day. a 24-hour lifeline to those affected by terror and conflict. Emuna in Israel helps 10,000 children and families every single day. Timeless Emuna. And we have with us Debbie Renenfeld, president of Amuna of America. Debbie, I know plenty of Amuna women here in Israel. Maybe just fill us in a little on what's not covered there in that presentation. Sure. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate in this important webinar. Amuna Israel is among Israel's leading social service organizations that was founded over 80 years ago to address the challenges within Israeli society. Many of you may think of, of Emunah as your grandmother's organization, and that would be correct. Our founders were incredible trailblazers who helped build the nation. But today, Emunah belongs to all of us. We are the daughters and granddaughters who are continuing their legacy and work, impacting and affecting the lives of future generations of Israelis. I am proud of our board, which is comprised of incredibly bright, talented, and professional women of all ages. What makes us unique is that we are the voice for religious and observant women. We provide social services 24 seven for over 10,000 children and families in Israel every day. What many people may not know is Amuna in Israel has been and continues to be involved in drafting laws and amendments to existing legislation. By that I mean, one of Emuna's main goals is to, adv is to advocate for the inclusion of women in Israeli public life and in leadership roles while remaining steadfast to the precepts of Jewish law. 
Emun and Israel advocates for equitable legislation regarding women's employment rights, women's integration into the religious establishment, family support and programs, assisting with religious divorces, and taking a firm stand against human trafficking. Due to the time restrictions today, I wanted to share with you a few examples of the work Emuna has done in this area. Regarding women's integration into the religious establishment, Emuna was instrumental in ensuring that women were included on the committee that appoints Dayanim, the judges in the Jewish religious courts. The purpose was to ensure women's voices and perspectives were heard. And because of Emunah's efforts, women are now part of this committee. At least four women preside in the committee and hold administrative roles. Another example is Emunah participates in appeals to the High Court and on Mesuravot Get, an appeal for a divorce when a husband refuses to appear, acknowledge, or grant his wife a get. Emuna has been added as a friend of the court to advocate on behalf of Agunot to ensure they have fair representation. These are just a few examples of the important work Emuna is doing in Israel. Emuna of America is a proud partner of the efforts of Emuna Israel in ensuring, ensuring equality for all women in Israel, regardless of their religious or socioeconomic backgrounds. We strongly believe that a society's success must include the advancement of women. Together with the other panelists featured today, we believe if we improve the lives of women in Israel, we will improve the lives of their families and future generations of Israelis. Thank you so much for allowing me to share some of Emunah's important work. Uh, Debbie, you mentioned human trafficking. That's such a hot button topic, really globally these days. And unfortunately, I have to say Israel also shares this problem. You'd mentioned it briefly. Talk a little, maybe just a little, about how Emunah deals with that issue. Okay, so um, on, um, well, you know, July of 2020, Israel was the eighth country to, to implement the Nordic model. The Nordic model is a human rights-based approach to laws and policies, policies regarding prostitution. This law ensures that the women who are the victims would not be criminalized for exploitation and abuse. Instead, it criminali criminalizes the hiring of sex workers. We are very proud that Amuna was part of the committee that ensured this law was passed. Amuna provides these victims of human trafficking, uh, therapeutic support, and vocational training within Amuna's network of services to help them to become productive members of Israeli society. And recently, Amun of America has partnered with Telem. It's another uh, nonprofit in Jerusalem whose mission is to really uh, rehabilitate and provide training and counseling to these young women who were the victims of human trafficking. Thank you, Debbie. Thank Joining you. us so next is Adassa. Adassa, the Women's Zionist Organization of America which is a volunteer organization that inspires a passion for and commitment to the land, the people and the future of Israel. Through education advocacy and youth development and its support of medical care and research at Adassa Medical Organization, Adassa enhances the health and lives of people in Israel, the United States and worldwide. At Hadassa, healing is at the heart of our mission and Israel is in our DNA. Our founder, Henrietta Zold, brought healing and medicine to pre-state Israel, paving the way for Israel's modern healthcare system. We proudly advance her legacy of healing the world. We heal the world through our internationally renowned Hadassah Medical Organization, which treats one million patients a year, regardless of race, religion, or nationality, and is recognized for its humanitarian efforts around the world. We heal the world by empowering women to make a difference. We raise our voices to affect change for critical issues, including the Never Again Education Act. Our youth villages in Israel provide education and support for at-risk young adults. And we are proud to fund scholarships for thousands of youths to attend Young Judea summer camps and Israel programs. For over a century, Hadassah has stood for healing our world today. Our passion and determination are stronger than ever. We need to be heard and we need not to be afraid. We need your voices to be loud. Well, with us is Rhoda Smola, the national president of Hadassah. And of course, my, my mother is a Hadassah lady, but uh, so I'm quite familiar. But Rhoda, maybe fill us in a little more 
on Hadassah's uh, work. Thank you so much for having us here today. It's really an honor to be here and to be able to talk about all of our wonderful organizations. Hadassah is a group, an organization of volunteers, close to 300,000 members, leaders, donors, and supporters. We are committed to the well being of Israel and we advocate. In, in the United States. We fund medical care in Israel. And as you mentioned earlier, we have the Hadassah Medical Organization, which was really the founding of the medical infrastructure of all of Israel. It is there, it has been there from the beginning before State of Israel. Um, our hospitals, we are extremely proud of it. We fundraise for them. Um, right now, they stand out because they are one of the seven biggest hospitals handling the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, from the beginning, we did many testing for the country. We have also been very involved in research. We created programs before any other hospital has, including inviting patients who have recovered to become volunteers to the sick patients in the hospital, because one of the terrible side effects of COVID patients in the hospital is depression and loneliness. So these volunteers come in and help the patients who are very sick. We are also renowned at the hospital for cutting edge research and for building bridges to peace. We treat and we stand side by side, doctors, nurses, and patients from all religions and all nationalities. It doesn't matter who, where you come from, we treat everyone and we're very proud of that. We also support youth villages. Our youth Aliyah villages um, support, take, we take in at-risk youth and we give them homes and support and education and it transforms them into productive citizens of Israel. We wield the power of the women who do, and we make a difference in the United States. Um, just this past year, we were able to support and help the United States Senate pass the Never Again Education Act, which hopefully will provide education across the country against hate and also reminding them of the results of the Holocaust. We're very proud of that. And right now, we are working along with the Conference of Presidents and many other organizations on getting the United States to understand and adapt and adopt um, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism along with its examples. We believe that is really important in today's world in the current conditions that we're living in. So I'm very proud to be part of Hadassah. I've been a member for over 40 years. And I think that we stand on the shoulders of our founder, Henrietta Zold, and she had no children, so many of us feel that we are her children, her grandchildren, or her great-grandchildren. And we're doing her work because we believe so much in the state of Israel and the power of Jewish women around the world. Right. And Rhoda, you mentioned Hadassah is really on the front lines of this battle against COVID, especially in Jerusalem. And unfortunately, I say that as a resident of Jerusalem. So how do you prevent that from becoming sort of all-consuming, that mission, and balance out and still carry out the other work? that Adasa does? So what, number one, we're very, very lucky. When COVID started, we were just renovating the iconic round building of Hadassah in Karim. And therefore we had an empty building. So this building houses our COVID wards while the medical needs and the medical work for the rest of Jerusalem and of Israel is being carried on in the other buildings at the hospital. We are very much involved in supporting and helping our hospital to do the amazing work it does. It was honored recently with eight awards for its research. Um, but at the same time, as you know, with an organization as big as ours, there are very many volunteers who are also willing and capable of handling the other things that we support, like Youth Aliyah and supporting scholarships for Young Judea. Um, we really believe in helping, empowering our women in the United States to advocate at the state level, at the county level, and wherever they can, so they feel strong and empowered as leaders of today and tomorrow. Thank you, Roda. It was Thank great you. to having you. Young Judea is the oldest Zionist youth movement in the United States. For over 100 years, Young Judea has brought together thousands of Jewish youth from across the country and around the world of every religious, cultural and political persuasion. For a shared commitment to Jewish values, Jewish pride and love of Israel.
And we have with us Adina Friedman, Chief Executive Officer of Young Judea. I myself was not involved in Young Judea before I came here, but most of my friends here are, were, and I really feel I missed out there. I'm very jealous of them. But Adina, tell us a little more, I know plenty about it, about Young Judea's work. Young Judea is a 110-year-old restartup. After many years of being the proud youth arm of Hadassah, in 2011, we decided to spread our wings and become an independent organization. Under Hadassah's auspices, Young Judea grew to become the largest Zionist youth movement in America. We remain forever grateful for Hadassah's role in our incubation and continued support. Young Judea is America's oldest Zionist youth movement. Our mission is to inspire American Jews' lifelong engagement with Israel and the Jewish people. In fulfilling this mission, we inspire Jewish youth of diverse backgrounds and orientations to become engaged leaders and inspired activists with a lifelong commitment to Israel, Jewish life, and tikkun olam, repairing the world. We accomplish this through immersive, informal, and experiential education, including our year-round youth group activities, seven Jewish summer camps around the United States. We will welcome over 2,000 campers for our COVID safe summer, and short and long-term Israel travel programs, including our gap year program. Right now, we have 225 young adults spending a year in Israel post high school, pre-college. They can earn college credits, travel the country, volunteer, intern, and make lifelong friends. With three months into this new role, it is clear that our next chapter is about making this a movement for this moment. While Young Judea has a rich legacy and tens of thousands of alumni, there's so much that has changed in the last 110 years. What does it mean to be a Zionist today? Something that is largely countercultural. Who are the youth that we are engaging today? And in what ways do they want to be engaged? What does it mean to be a movement? Where are we headed and what are we working towards? And in what ways does a North American backdrop inform the answers to these questions? Our current context demands that we answer this question. What does it mean to be a Zionist youth movement in North America today? This is a very exciting time for Young Judea. As a restartup, there's new energy and excitement about reframing Young Judea for this time. Every conversation I have with an alum starts down memory lane, but inevitably turns to dreaming about a new future, one that is pregnant with possibility. There are many second or third generation Judean families and each year an equal num number of new families that are joining Young Judea. We have the opportunity to shape this movement with and for them. Thank you. Right, Adina, you've certainly taken on this job at a particularly challenging time, it has to be said. Now, uh, as you mentioned, so much of Young Judea is about group activities either in the States or here or between Israel and the States. So talk about the challenges that have been posed during this period by the uh, pandemic. Absolutely. Well, you can just imagine the sadness, the disappointment of so many of our campers last summer, right? Over 2,000 of them who were anticipating heading to camp, uh, reuniting with old friends, and spending a summer immersed in our educational environment when we had to sadly shut down camp last summer. We did very quickly pivot into a virtual environment. So we were able to host a Wi-Fi summer for many of our campers, although not the same, clearly. You can't breathe the same fresh outdoor, outdoor air, but it, we had to do. And we are now gearing up for another summer. Um, we're, we're very excited about what is gonna happen, of course, in a very COVID safe way, but we will absolutely welcome our 2,000 plus campers this summer. In terms of our Israel program, we are actually 225 strong in Israel today. Um, it has certainly not been a boring uh, year. You can imagine within the first two weeks, our uh, young adults had to quarantine, and then we've had repeated lockdowns in and out. Our staff, our team has been absolutely extraordinary in changing in the moment, day to day, what the itinerary and program is going to be to ensure a quality ex and exciting experience and, and meaningful experience for all of our participants. And, uh, and we, we remain strong. We continue to do what we do as everyone, as all of us have been modifying in, in the moment. 
Right, I just a follow up on modifying in the moment. Are you able to even make plans for the coming year, given the dynamics of the situation, certainly here in Israel, and I guess now things starting to move? Do you have to have sort of alternative plans in place and able to be able to shift uh, as with, with the developments of the pandemic? We do. With the benefit of this year is that we actually have a, tr a tremendous amount of experience in having to be nimble in the way that I described. So, you know, opening this summer, even with all the changes, as you can imagine, we're waiting for each state to announce the, uh, the changes in, in the health regulations, the caps at each camp, how many campers are going to be able to accommodate, what they're going to require in terms of testing, in terms of vaccinations for staff. And with everything changing uh, on, on the daily, we are used to that and, and certainly have had a tremendous amount of experience this year doing that. And we remain optimistic. We, we are planning to open this summer, as I mentioned, to uh, invite to our, our addition, our new year course group for this coming year. And, as, and yes, we have contingency plans, of course, because we, we never close down. We continue to do the work that we do in, in creative and, and different ways. Right. Uh, but uh, I just want to clarify, you did say the, cam the camps are going forward in some form, the ones in the U.S. this year. Is that right? In some form or another? Uh our current plan is to open and to open in a COVID safe way. Yes. All right. Uh, Adina Friedman, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, Adina. Our next organization, Naamat USA, is a nonprofit volunteer organization that partners with Naamat Israel to provide vital educational and social services for women, children, and families in need in Israel. Take a look. felt the need that I should be doing something here in the United States as a Jewish woman to give back to Israel. It's such a very form of social services. It's, it's amazing. Legal aid, domestic violence shelter, preschool, high school. So we cover a lot of problems in society that arise. <laughs> שאתה מרגיש בבית איתו. והגשמתי כאילו חלום, שלא חשבתי שיהיה לי בחיים. ולפני כן לא הייתי חושבת שיהיה לי תעודה גבוהה. אם לא הייתי מגיעה לכאן. Nanmat has been around for a long time, but it is an organization that is so vital, providing a very unique and specialized service to the women and children and the families of Israel, both in terms of taking care of women and children in crisis, as well as giving women and children opportunities that they might not have otherwise. We've developed these very uh, deep and long-term relationships. It's definitely like family. I am a third-generation Nanmat member. I was born into the organization. My grandmother held many positions including national president. It was very important to her and my grandfather. I realized there was nothing for my generation, and it was very important for us to continue the path of Namat and the mission. I feel connected that even though I'm here, I am helping those social services. It just makes me feel like I'm doing something with a purpose for Israel. It was so meaningful for me when my grandmother donated to Naamat's Tech for Teens in honor of my bar mitzvah because it helps provide technology tools, resources, and classes for at-risk Israeli children who are interested in technology like me but who are less fortunate and who might need a second chance to get their lives on the right track. I heard about the NALMOD's Tech for Teens program from my grandmother, who's a life member of NALMOD USA. I wanted to help kids in Israel who can't afford computers and software so they can have an easier time in school. So I donate part of my bar mitzvah money to NALMOD's Tech for Teens program. This is a great opportunity to thank you and convey my deepest gratitude for the support and empowerment of us young women at the beginning of our academic career. NAMAT is changing the face of Israel one person at a time. And we have with us Jan Gorovich, president of Namat USA. And again, of course, as a resident of Israel, I'm quite familiar with Namat. But Jan, talk a little more about some of the aspects of the, the work that you've been doing that maybe not, were not covered so much within that presentation. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Namat USA, formerly Pioneer Women, and we're about to celebrate our 100th birthday, uh, is part of a worldwide movement of women. We are located in nine countries, which include Canada, Israel, Belgium, Brazil, 
Mexico, Uruguay, Argentina, and Peru. Although we may not speak a common language, we have always shared a common vision. Our goal is to provide opportunity through education. We firmly believe that every child and woman should have the tools they will need to achieve their highest aspirational goals. Today, I will share with you a glimpse of some of the programs NAMAD is involved in. In Israel, we provide over 17,000 children at approximately 200 centers quality daycare each year. Children come from diverse social and economic backgrounds. Financial assistance is provided to low-income families. We are particularly proud of our Shalom Center in Jaffa. Just like the staff at the center, the students are divided equally between Jews and Arabs, Christians and Muslims, and over the clamoring noise and enthusiasm of the children, it is difficult to determine who is who. Our 17 alternative high schools and two youth villages with approximately 4,800 students provide a second opportunity to become educationally proficient. Students with a wide range of problems, including abuse, neglect, addiction, and many from unprivileged backgrounds are welcomed into small classrooms taught by specially trained and caring teachers. Many new immigrants from Ethiopia and the former Soviet Union are also enrolled in the high schools. These schools combine academic subjects with courses in fields such as communications, computer science, photography, computer graphics, and fashion design. Teenage boys and girls combine theoretical studies with technological and vocational training. There is modern and updated equipment, computers, and photography labs. This hands-on learning is crucial, especially for many students with learning disabilities. Upon graduation, these students are prepared to succeed and live useful, productive lives. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our professional scholarship program. Each year, NAMA awards financial assistance to about 200 academically gifted Israeli women, enabling them to follow their dreams and pursue uh, their careers. Um, this year, NAMA USA and NAMA Canada will be holding a virtual gala to celebrate our new scholarship winners and to raise funds for next year's recipients. We're happy to announce that Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer, recipient of our Golda Meir Humanitarian Award, will be our keynote speaker. As NAMAT's national president, I am so proud of what we do. I hope when time allows and we are again able to travel, you will come visit our installations in Israel. Thank you very much. Now, Jan, so much of what NAMAT, as you described it, does depends on, let's say, person-to-person -person contact, education. I think you used even the phrase hands on learning. So, of course, during this past year, how has the, again, the uh, coronavirus impacted on the work that NAMAT is doing? Well, I will tell you that our daycare, at every opportunity, we provide, we have provided uh, daycare because it's an essential part of family life as well as the economy so that uh, parents are able to work either in, in person or remotely. Um, one of the biggest challenges has been the issue of domestic violence, which has been on the rise because of COVID. And we've, we've created a hotline, a recognized hotline, the way in America, an emergency is 911, and uh, uh, we created a hotline so that people can reach out and get help. Um, uh, very often, uh, it's very difficult because uh, families are now contained in a very tight environment and tensions uh, become very high, and there's been an increase in domestic violence. And has that maybe done, have you given some thought to on a longer term how this could maybe uh, impact or alter your thinking on some of these services rather than it just even being a temporary effect? Well, um, surely we hope the, there will be improvement in the area of domestic violence, that there'll be a decrease, that we will be able to give women the tools to deal with it. Uh, in addition, we, have, we provide services for men as well because we Many men are aware of the fact this is not the way I want to live. This is not a good family life. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better husband. In terms of the schools themselves, we have switched to virtual uh, education. And uh, it's, it may come a time where we will be hybrid. I mean, we have found in terms of our clubs in the United States, we were all in-person meeting and we've, we've flourished using virtual techniques. So we, we see a, uh, a hybrid version is maybe the ideal uh, form going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So now let's talk about the VIZO, the Women's International Zionist Organization, is a political international movement dedicated to the advancement of the status of women, welfare for all sectors of Israeli society, and encouragement of Jewish education in Israel and in the diaspora. And with us is uh, Mireille Mano Cherian. She's the co-president of, well, in Israel we say Vizo. I don't know if it's Vizo USA or in the US you would say Vizo. Uh, but Mireille, uh, tell us a, maybe a little more. Of course, here in Israel, very, we're all very familiar with Vizo. So tell us maybe a little more about the organization's activities. Well, thank you, Frank and AZM, for having me today. Vizo is an apolitical organization, or rather I should say, Vizo is a movement with over 250,000 Zionist volunteers worldwide working together for the last 100 years. Our mission is to protect, to educate, and to empower the neediest members of Israeli society and support the advancements of the status of women. In fact, Vizo is the number one partner of the Israeli government when it comes to social services through our 800 projects. And I would like to divide the scope of our work in five divisions, our early age, our youth, our Ethiopian immigrants, our women, and our elderly. And I'll start with our early age division. We run 183 daycare centers covering the entire country with a total of 14,000 children, mostly from high-risk homes. And I must say that our centers are very known for the quality of their education. Our second division is our youth. We served 5,500 students, mostly from high risk, grades seven to 12. And we run one boarding school for students with severe emotional problems, two vocational schools, and five youth villages where students combine formal education with learning vocational skills. Our students live either with their parents who come from the community, or they live in foster homes or boarding schools, or they are part of our NALE program, which is our young immigrant who come and make an aliyah before their parents. And we are very proud of the success of our youth division because 95% of those high-risk students end up enlisting in the IDF and over 85% attend college. The third division is our Ethiopian children. Vizo has two after-school centers in partnership with the Elie Wiesel Foundation, serving the Ethiopian immigrant community. They provide much needed support and narrowed to narrow the educational gap between the Ethiopian and the Israeli students. Our fourth division is our women's division. 
I must say that Vito is on the, at the forefront of combating domestic violence and protecting women against discrimination, including lobbying for appropriate legislation. And we do that, we have, have two battered women shelters that provide safe haven for mothers and their children, plus one center for prevention and treatment of violence, violence in the family. And our goal is to help abused women become independent and self-sufficient. And we also provide a full year of support once they leave our shelters. Now there is one particular service that we provide that is extremely unique to the region and probably in the entire world is our men's hotline. And it's a service of trained volunteers that provide anonymous support for abusers or potential abusers before they are about to commit a crime or hurt their partners. And our fifth division is our parents' home. We have one, one, one old age home in Tel Aviv that we, we have 100 residents. And, um, and that's in, in a nutshell our work, but we have so many programs in between. So thank you for the opportunity. Right, I mean, right, so much of what you've described would have to have been impacted by uh, the pandemic over the past year. But so maybe give us, give us just one example of the way WITSO had to adjust uh, with one of those efforts or programs uh, to the conditions enforced by the coronavirus? Sure. Um, well, in particular, our worst affected part of our five division were our women's and uh, our demand for our services increased by 300%. And we had to open an emergency shelter to, to take those women that were trapped with their abusers and give them a, a safe haven and not you know, a peace for them before they were able to be moved to another shelter. And the demand for our men's, hot, our men's hotline increased by 500%. And we had to, again, add more volunteers to that service. Um, and I wanna just add that our daycare centers, our nine of them in hospitals were the only one open and were able to take care of all the, pers uh, the personnel in the hospital. Um, that was something that we were very, very proud of. And uh, our youth, we, were, we had to purchase computers for all of them and, uh, and ensure that those children who had to go back to abusive homes, they were able to stay in our boarding school. So we had to make some arrangements. Thank you, Mireille. So I have to say, Kalev, I'm very impressed by the quality of the work and the commitment very of so. all this uh, organization. And it's a pleasure now to have with us, for the closing remark, uh, Richard, Richard Eidemann, the president of the American Zionist uh, movement. Hi, Richard. Hi, Frank, and to you and Kalev and everyone at I-24 News, on behalf of all of the organizations of the American Zionist movement, uh, we want to thank you, uh, everyone at I-24 News, for our partnership between the American Zionist Movement, all of our organizations that work across the United States and in Israel and around the world in order to uh, highlight the important work that is being done by each and every one of our organizations, standing up for Zionism, standing up for the good name of Israel, and the Jewish people and helping people from across all walks of life. We're so very pleased and proud to have this partnership with I-24 News that allows us to spotlight the AZM organizations and allows us to show the world the important work that I-24 News is doing. We look forward to continuing our partnership with you and we look forward to continuing to applaud the work of each and every one of the AZM organizations. They do great work. Kola Kavod, Toda. Thank you, Richard. I want to say that uh, I'm also very happy and proud about our partnership. 
it's uh, very interesting to give the opportunity to all this organization to speak and to explain what they are doing. And, and again, I'm telling you that uh, all the organization affiliated to AZM have the opportunity to use I24 News as a platform, as a tool to deliver all the messages. We have many shows. You, you had the opportunity today to speak with Kalev, and we have also many magazines uh, to show stories which are also uh, helping us to fight against uh, BDS because uh, through your work, we are showing another reality. So it's the second time we are doing that, uh, Richard. Uh, I really hope, really, that the third one will be live here in the studio of I24 News without this mask. But I want to wish you all the best, to thank you again for what you, you are doing, to thank you, Caleb, for your time, because you have to go to work and to prepare your prime time show for tonight, and to wish you a, a good day, and I hope to see you soon on I24 News. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.